Thank you very much indeed. Your Royal Highness, Lords, ladies and gentlemen. The successful spread and growth of human populations and the fact that we live longer, healthier lives on average than any previous generation is really a consequence of the successful history of agriculture, of food production, of storage and distribution. And this really is a history of science and innovation and putting that innovation into practice. And indeed, you can write the history of humanity and indeed many other species that we share the planet with through the lens of agricultural and food. And just one interesting example is the spread of the ability to digest lactose into adult life. And that spread through human populations rapidly as we became pastoral and drank milk because it gave a real selective survival advantage to be able to digest milk into adult life. And now, of course, with over 7.5 billion people living on the planet, uh, we're starting to pay a high environmental price. And about 25% of our global carbon emissions come from agriculture. And of course, the runoff of phosphate and nitrate the fertilizer that's been so important in the development of modern agriculture is polluting water in different parts of the world, resulting in eutrophica eutrophication. Uh, we've heard a bit about the loss of biodiversity. And the challenge and the opportunity is to make our agriculture, our food production more sustainable. And we face particular challenges in the UK because our farm productivity overall hasn't increased very much since the early 1980s. And in that respect, we're far behind other countries. And indeed, if you look at the wide variation that there is in agricultural productivity, about 50% of our farm land produces about 80% of the output of agriculture in the UK. And of course, the corollary of that is that the other 50% produces only 20% of the output. And so the challenge is, how do we make food production more resource efficient? With the opportunity, as we've heard from Charles Burrell, to free up land to cater for carbon storage, for recreation, and for wildlife. And there are huge opportunities that come from research and innovation uh, through biology, in our ability to develop improved strains of crops, of livestock, uh, in uh, developing better understanding of soil health. There are opportunities in how we use energy to generate power, uh, to the use of renewable energy sources, solar and wind. The opportunity to grow high quality foods in smarter ways, indoors, for example, in climatically ideal conditions, uh, vertical farms, as we've again heard about today, um, with renewable energy providing 24 hour light and the opportunity to raise carbon dioxide levels to get more efficient growth. How we can use manufacturing and digital technologies better. Um, although, talking of robotics, which comes up a lot, I was struck that I thought that uh, Matt Smith uh, would take a long time be, 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 be beaten by a robot shearer, um, beating that in 44 seconds. I think only in Wallace and Gromit films does that happen. <laughs> But there is robotics, there's synthetic biology. Um, and of course, we are in the UK a leader in food technology. So uh, you know your sector better than I do. It supports a very large number of jobs. Um, it uses a lot of our land. Um, and of course, there are all of the policy issues and changes as the UK leaves the European Union and the Secretary of State for DEFRA will have spoken about that this morning. Um, but I would argue that research and innovation is absolutely critical to ensure that we have a continuing uh, prosperous and uh, successful and competitive sector. So I thought I might just briefly introduce UK research and innovation to you, because I think all parts of it are relevant to your community in different ways. We're a new organisation. We started on the 1st of April last year, and we bring together the seven research councils, um, uh, Innovate UK and part of our dual support system, Research England, which works with its counterparts in the devolved administrations. But the Research Councils and Innovate UK are UK-wide organizations, and indeed we fund internationally, where we work in partnership with countries around the globe. 
And of course, traditionally, uh, much of your support would have come from the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, and there's a BBSRC exhibit um, upstairs. Um, but also a National Natural Environment Research Council. But in fact, all of the research councils are relevant because the social sciences matter. And I think a lot of the discussion about science sometimes gets confused with discussion about values. And so if you're talking about genetically modified organisms, the question isn't really, is this a good or bad technology? Because it depends what gene, what organism, and for what purpose. And when we're looking at any technology, we've got to look at it through the lens of precisely for what purpose is it being used. And so the question isn't, as I say, are GMOs a good thing or a bad thing? It's precisely what you're using them for. There are some people who believe that we shouldn't fiddle with nature. That is a values decision. It's a, decision, a position we should respect. But at the end of the day, we live in plural democratic societies. And I think all too often, discussion about science and technology gets confused with discussion about values. And I think we need to be clear that these are separate in a way. We need to be able to debate the science and then decide how and if and when we're going to use the technology. So the numbers. Um, you've already heard we have a large budget and it comes from all of our pockets. It's funded by the taxpayer. So more than six and a half billion pounds in combined budget each year. Uh, we issue about 4,000 research and business grants uh, through Innovate UK, which is business facing and again, highly relevant to uh, this community. Um, there are about 2,500 business led collaborative projects and knowledge transfer partnerships each year. We fund the majority of universities in the UK. And you will know many of the institutes that we fund. So, Rothamsted, for example, the John Innes Centre in Nor Norwich. A new institute uh, close to here, the Rosalind Franklin Institute at Didcot, and we have centers for agricultural innovation. And ultimately, what are we about? Well, what we're about is delivering economic impact and social prosperity. So it's the benefits of research. It's about an enriched, healthier, more resilient, and sustainable society. And if we're going to be able to do that, we need to be able to push the frontiers of human knowledge and understanding. So that's about supporting research. And it's a mixture of research. It's people who want to discover things. Um, and, and there it's a question of identifying people that have good track record, that have imagination, that have the passion to pursue research questions. And then it's about applying that knowledge uh, through innovation and tackling some of the problems that the sectors such as the agricultural sector face, bovine tuberculosis, for example, the issue we heard about earlier about the, the more effective diagnosis of bovine tuberculosis in cattle and in cervids. Um, and we can only, of course, push the frontiers of human knowledge and understanding if we have the best environment for research and innovation. And that is about recognizing, first of all, that we have to be global in our outlook. We need to be an environment which can attract the best talent from across the world. The best researchers will seek out the best researchers and innovators wherever they can be found. It's ultimately about talent, and it's about developing talent from PhDs, from master's students, all the way through to the most senior professors. And it's about having a trustworthy and a diverse system where we can support all of the talents and of course, we can only do this if we have good infrastructure for research and innovation. And then, so our job is, if we're going to be able to support that, to be a decent organization ourselves. So in the farming agri-sector, and almost every council, so the Arts and Humanities Research Council is important too, because that enables us to understand the history of uh, the sector. Um, there's no area of our activity that isn't relevant. Um, but the science, the research and its application is obviously absolutely fundamental and some of the platforms and the institutes where specialist skills can be developed. I've talked about the importance of collaboration um, and it's always said that if you have papers that bring together researchers from different countries, they tend to be more cited than papers that are not. Now, one's got to be careful about that. That's a correlation, not a causation. It doesn't mean that if you just bung together two random researchers from two different countries, their paper will be more cited. 
it tells you just that the best researchers seek out the best researchers wherever they are. Uh, but it is about multidisciplinarity. It's about recognizing that if we're going to tackle the problems that you face, we need to look at them from different dimensions. And uh, bovine tuberculosis is a good example of that, where we need to look at it through the lens of uh, the, tuber the, uh, the, the tuberculosis bacterium, my Mycobacterium bovis, but we also need to look at the social science to understand what's going on. Um, and then, of course, it's one thing to discover something. It's another thing to actually innovate and apply it. And, of course, I thought what was great about the presentations we heard earlier was seeing the sort of characteristics of <coughs> innovators, the passion that goes with it, the single-mindedness, the leadership. Um, those are really important skills. And one of the problems, I think, for the UK and for um, almost every sector of industry, actually, is that if you look at the gap between the most productive and the least productive companies in every sector, you'll find that the gap between them is greater than in almost every other OECD country. And that's one of the big challenges for the agricultural sector, which is not only how do we innovate, but how do we diffuse that innovation throughout um, agricultural businesses of different sorts. So, as I've said, farming today is uh, very different from farming in previous generations, and it is the product of centuries of research and innovation. And you are a community that does science and research as part of your everyday jobs. You measure what happens, you understand the interaction between the environment and your crops, your livestock. You're constantly inquiring and learning. And, of course, much of the agricultural development that we've seen has been done by citizen science, if you like. It hasn't been done by researchers in universities. It's been done by farmers in practice. Um, but with all of the talk about genetic modification, I think we should recognize that the crops that we have today, and indeed the livestock, are utterly different to those of the past. And I think maize is an extremely good example of that. You can just about see in that bottom figure that the plant that modern maize descended from is a plant called teosint, uh, which was found in Mexico and has about 12 kernels and bears hardly any resemblance at all to modern maize, which has more than 500 kernels. Its genome has undergone duplication. Uh, it has thousands, tens of thousands of mutations. Um, and yet we don't think about that as genetically modified. But it's about as genetically modified as it can be, and that's been done by breeding, and that applies to almost all of our crops and our livestock as well. And of course, global crop harvests, harvests have been estimated to be about twice what they would be without the invention of nitrogen fertilizer in 1908. Uh, this is an experiment that is absolutely fascinating. And any of you that have been lucky enough to go to Rothamsted will have had the opportunity to see this. This is the oldest, I think, single experiment probably in the world. Um, it started in 1843, um, and the aim on one particular field was to test the effect of different organic manures and inorganic fertilizers on the yield of winter wheat. And uh, they have samples going back to the 1840s, and you can see the whole evolution of modern wheat on that one field. Um, and the research that was done there included the discovery and development of systemic herbicides and insecticides. And importantly, it led to the introduction of the modern short-strawed cultivars, which have an increase in the grain yields and a decrease in straw yields. And that one experiment may, has made and continues to make huge contributions in virology, in nematode uh, science, in soil science, in pesticide resistance. And as I said in my introduction, I think that you can really closely relate the history of humanity to the history of farming. And of course, in the first industrial revolution, uh, led from the UK, we had first the steam engine, and then of course much later the internal combustion engines that followed the industrial revolutions, the development of combine harvesters, um, and of course then the effects of breeding. Um, and since 1982, 90% uh, of the contribution to yield gain in cereals has come from plant breeding. And of course, increasingly, with the genome revolution that's going on around the world, with the UK as a major leader, it's driven by a greater understanding of the genetics that actually underlie the different traits in crops. But I think the challenge now is the current industrial revolution, which is at least as great, if not greater, 
than the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries. And that's driven by information technology to a very large extent, with opportunities for precision agriculture and the ability for remote monitoring. And I can't help commenting with the picture of the drone in the field up there uh, that this is a, a good example of a technology which is neutral. It has the opportunity for bad applications, as we've seen very dramatically in the past couple of the weeks. Uh, but it also has very important opportunities in agriculture for the ability to monitor fields, crops, livestock at a precision and in ways that have never been possible before. And that's one of the areas where we have to get the policies right. Because it's clear that the technology can cause harm, but it's also clear there's an opportunity for great benefit. And the work that's done at places like the Earlham Institute in Norwich, uh, developing CropQuant, which is a platform that uses data and artificial intelligence to track crop performance across fields um, and provides an affordable solution to automating looking at crops and how they're developing and preventing crop losses and contributing to food security. And importantly, it's one thing to know what a crop does in a laboratory. It's another thing to know what it does in a field. Um, breeding technologies are quite extraordinary, really. Uh, traditional genetics is still extremely powerful and now, of course, informed by a much greater understanding of genetic variation across genomes. Um, but then, of course, there are all of the techniques of genetic modification of one sort or another through to the latest form, which is gene editing. And researchers at the Roslyn Institute at Edinburgh, for example, have used gene editing to create pigs that are resistant to the important viral disease, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. And then, of course, designing future wheat at John Innes Centre and at Rothamsted is screening existing and new wheat varieties for traits such as disease resistance and drought tolerance. So we have amazing tools, but of course the policy question is how we regulate those in a way that enable the crops to be used uh, for the effects to be monitored. Uh, recently, we've developed four centres for agricultural innovation, which are led by Innovate UK. Um, and they're very much about uh, supporting the adoption, the development, and the commercialisation of agritech. And as I say, the challenge, I think, to a significant extent, is diffusion as much as discovery and innovation in the first place. It's how we actually spread uh, new ideas when they work effectively. It's about turning innovation into commercial opportunity, encouraging co-investment, um, and so we have four of the Centres for Agricultural Innovation, uh, one in agrometrics, so measuring what goes on, uh, one in crop health and protection, uh, one for innovation excellence in livestock, and an agri-epicentre, which is about uh, precision agriculture. And then as part of the industrial strategy, um, we have a, a particular challenge, which is called transforming food production, which is in development at the moment, and this is a very significant investment of up to £90 million, which is being led from UK Research and Innovation, working very closely with advisors from the community. Um, and the opportunity is to transform food production so that we can increase UK productivity uh, to be near the market leaders by 2030. But it's also about reducing the environmental impacts and minimising waste, which of course is a very important topic at the moment. There's no question that we are world leading in our um, agriculture research. Uh, UK wheat genetics research has contributed to UK and global increases in wheat yields by the creation of new wheat varieties. Um, a recent example, uh, UKRI and DFID funded researchers, and we collaborate extensively with the Department for International Development, um, work by Professor Laura Green at the University of Warwick um, using a single injection of antibiotic help 95% of sheep suffering from foot rot to recover. And so that helped cut the number of lame sheep in the UK flock by half, um, with very significant economic and health consequences for sheep. And of course, blue tongue, which is a disease that's become salient because of changing climate in the UK, uh, the ability to test rapidly for that um, is important, and tests have been developed that enable us to reduce testing times from three weeks to a single day. Um, 
research is a global endeavor, but so is agriculture, so is food production and distribution. And of course, that is one of the important challenges that we face going forward. Um, and we have a global food security program, which is a 14 and a half million pound program led between UK Research Innovation, DEFRA, and others. And that's looking at the resilience of our food system in a global context. And again, it brings together the natural and the social sciences. So looking at what happens in the UK food system to a variety of shocks, of which, of course, one is potentially coming rather soon. <clears throat> uh, the environmental factors, I think, are extremely important. And again, uh, research and innovation is going to be vital if we're going to tackle them from the role of uh, carbon emissions through to nitrogen, phosphorus, and eutrophication. Um, and of course, the challenge is that around a quarter of global carbon dioxide emissions are caused by agriculture, uh, but equally, we need to be able to feed uh, 9 to 10 billion people by 2050. Um, not all of this requires high technology solutions. So, for example, a piece of software developed by the University of Aberdeen called the Cool Farm Tool software um, helps uh, producers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from supply chains and delivers savings from farmers. And that's being used around the world and by some major food companies as well. So, to wind up, um, the opportunities, I think, are huge. There is no question that research and innovation is going to continue to be important. And I think the big question to everyone in this room is how the UK will move through the industrial revolution that we're going through at the moment. The world is going to look very different in terms of its food production in 20 or 30 years, and the question is what will our place be in it? You saw um, in some of the examples, uh, for example, the hydroponic development of the microgreens, some of the new ways in which food can be produced. And that is efficient. Um, it, uh, it uses solar energy and other energy sources uh, very effectively. Where are we going to be in all of this? So I think, to summarize, our challenges are better diffusion, what is going to happen as a result of EU exit for both trade and labor. Um, science sometimes becomes an excuse or a means of creating trade barriers. And innovative foods fall into that category. And so I think how we just look at the science carefully, then think about the issues of social values alongside them, I think is important. There are going to be a lot of policy questions around the introductions of new types of crops, um, gene editing just being one of many examples, how we regulate most effectively, uh, for example, chemicals, and finally, the whole question about sustainable food to the future. So thank you for your attention. It's been a privilege to be asked to give this lecture. Um, I, I first spoke to um, a, a, a farming community uh, when I spoke at the National Farmers Union Conference about four or five years ago. And I must say, when you go to medical school originally, you don't think you're going to end up speaking at um, conferences about farming. Um, although uh, medicine and plant health are not in any sense unrelated. But one thing that I have been struck by is the, the deep appreciation of the importance of research, of science and innovation in agriculture. And I think if there are any ways in which UK research and innovation can help and work with you, we would all be truly delighted. Thank you for your attention. Mark, if you'd like to join me here.